بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد المهدي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يان سورة 34 سورة السبع from ayah 22 أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل ادعوا الذين زعمتم من دون الله لا يملكون مثقال ذرة في السماوات ولا في الأرض وما لهم فيهما من شرك وما له منهم من ظهير The surah begins with Alhamdulillah or praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the reason for that is that he controls and owns everything in the heavens and the earth he knows what comes into the earth and what comes into the heavens so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ownership uh, and sovereignty is one reason why we say all praise due to Allah alhamdulillah mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then shows us that when he gives from his fadl, his rahmah and his mercy to some of his servants like Dawood and his son Suleiman. Then they perform acts and deeds based on their iman in Allah, their belief in Allah. That they believe Allah owns and controls everything that he has created and they use that as a platform to produce and to create and uh, to facilitate worship. Right? Then there is the example of the people of Saba, whom we discussed last week. The people of Sheba. That they also believed in Allah once and then they stopped believing in Him. And they saw that the ni'mah Allah gave was theirs and not Allah's. And they rejected Allah. And they rejected people. And whatever happened to them, happened. So the insinuation of the devil, Iblis, comes into the minds of human beings. And uh, he uses a person's and a people's ability to manipulate and control <coughs> the resources that Allah has created for them as a means uh, to control others and to manipulate others and to give others a false sense of authority in them. So in these ayat that we are discussing today, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing this reality that no one owns anything except Allah neither in divinity, nor in sovereignty, nor in any other shape or form where you can say that they are able to effect change either in a good way or in a bad way if they do not believe in Allah. So Allah is the reason why we exist and Allah is the reason why we have any ni'mah from Him. Others inherit this ni'mah from the fact that Allah has given them this ability to use and benefit from whatever He has created. So in this ayah, قُلِدْ أُلَّذِينَ زَعَمْتُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Say, O Muhammad وسلم, call upon those people whom you think and assume can do something for you besides Allah. Call them. Uh, and you may petition and you may supplicate that they can actually do something uh, without Allah's permission. لا يملكون مثقال ذرة They do not own even an atom's amount. A seed amount of weight in the heavens. Nor in the earth. They have no authority. Neither on earth nor in the heavens. 
They just assume, and you assume they have some authority. You want to refuse people uh, entry into the U.S. and so on, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down a flood uh, where everyone is evacuated. Now you have to spend your resources on rehabilitating those people. You don't own anything. You don't control. You don't control anything. Period. Right? So the idea is that you believe in Allah and then you benefit yourselves and others. So you don't assume that because people have some temporary authority on earth, which is God-given, that they control everything. They control nothing. لا يملكون مثقال They don't own, nor do they control or govern even an atom's amount of weight neither in the heavens nor the earth. وَمَا لَهُمْ فِيهِمَا مِنْ شِرْكٍ Nor do they have any partnership therein at all. وَمَا لَهُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ ظَهِيرٍ And nor do they have any helper besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ظَهِيرٍ Any uh, champion, any helper, any assistant. That they can say that we will now say to God that we will do this and we will do that. And you will help us or God will help us. Meaning that a human being's inability to do anything without Allah's will is very evident everywhere in the world. Everywhere in the world. The point is when man-made sufferings become prevalent, then there should be man-made solutions for those man-made sufferings. So the catastrophe that human beings have created in places like Burma and Syria and other places in the world, mostly the Muslim world, they must be uh, the, the same, uh, you know, types of solutions that are man-made and as, well, as long as human beings understand and accommodate each other, Allah will continue His favors upon people. Huh? And if that door stops, then something else will happen. You won't have anything to do anything. Yeah. We won't make too much qiyas on the dam of Aram and that dam that uh, failed in California. You can as some kind of light entertainment. <laughs> But at the end, end, of, end of the day, it affects us also. Because then, we are part of the whole edifice and system in this country. Then we have to say what we need to say in order to make sure that people don't believe that they are God. Yeah. So you help people because Allah wants you to help them. And you don't stop your help and assistance to people. Simply because you fear whatever it is you fear, then Allah will show you another way where you will have to help people anyway. So that's what the next ayah is saying. وَلَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا لِمَنْ أَذِينَ لَهُ That no shafa'a, no intercession is going to help anyone except the one whom Allah gives permission to. If you believe in Allah and you are close to Allah and you show yourself and Allah that you are kind and you are, you are pious and you want to be God-fearing, then there's hope that Allah may say to you that, okay, whoever you want to intercede for, I will give you permission. But if you play God yourself and you deny Allah's commandments and you say that I don't care what God says, what religion says, what revelation says, then there's no hope for you, never mind for anyone else through you. Right. So here the, the, the Islamic creed and doctrine and the akhidah al shafa'ah, which is intercession, is of many types. And intercession on the Day of Judgment uh, is there in the Sunnah, and it will only be when Allah gives permission to the Prophet ﷺ first, and then to other Prophets, and then to other people, that intercession will be allowed. 
but it is a, it is not the norm, it is the exception for the procedures of the Day of Judgment. It's not normal, but it's illa man adhim, it's an exception. Yeah, so we as Muslims, we do not rely on shafa'ah, simply saying that the Prophet will save us or others will save us. No. You do your own work. That no one carries the burden of anyone else. And it is your actions that will be audited on the Day of Judgment. And if Allah gives permission to the Prophet ﷺ, he will. And if he doesn't, then he won't. We ask Allah that he gives the Prophet ﷺ permission to intercede for us also, inshallah. حتى إذا فزع عن قلوبهم قالوا ماذا قال ربهم so much so to the extent that when their hearts are now uh, petrified and terrified فزع yeah. that uh, there is this horrible experience of the day of judgment that people will be so engrossed and submerged about their own welfare their own salvation about their own actions and their iman and kufr, that they will not be in a state to look at the person next to them. And this will happen. And then people will say, Qalu mada? They will say, as if they are asking anyone around them, What is this? Qala rabbukum. Qalu al-haq. Someone will answer, Allah will answer, Rabbukum, this is your Lord. Qalu al-haq, then they will realize this. this is now the ultimate truth. So if you can imagine a hall in which there is absolute darkness, then extend that imagination to the outside, where there is no sun, no moon, no stars, and it's totally pitch dark. Then who do you see and who do you ask? Because you don't know anything. You can't see anything, you can't feel anything. This is what is meant by this ayah. Hatta ida fuzzi'a an kulubi. That they will be made to feel terror and fright away from their hearts. I mean, even their hearts will have no hope whatsoever. Usually in your heart there's a sign of hope. So the terror will and the fright will remove any element of hope from their hearts. This is how people will be. And then in that frantic okay, commo- uh, commotion and confusion, uh, they will say, Mother, what is this? Where did this come from? It will be the greatest cultural shock that anyone has experienced. Someone will say, or Allah will say, Rabbukum, this is your Lord. Uh, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has created this spectacular event which is uh, terrifying and horrible and frightening. Qalu al haq Then the angels will say, He has spoken the truth. Or people will say, That Allah has spoken the truth. This is the haq. This is the truth. So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala painting this picture for human beings of the day of judgment so that human beings can prepare for that day and that moment which will extend for some people al aman al 50,000 years that one moment as some of the ulama say Allah make it easy for us inshallah al-kabir He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He is the most high al-kabir, the great and the greatest al-kabir, the greatest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be High and high above all of this spectacle because he will be creating this huge, huge spectacle. And he is the greatest that he is able to create anything he wants to. So you are slightly terrified and frightened in this world when a few things go wrong. And you seem to be derailed in your life either as an individual or as a group or community or as a state. And then you panic. So now you imagine that, God forbid, there's an earthquake, or God forbid, there's a flood, or God forbid, there's a severe hurricane, or something, then you all, we all panic, as we should do, and we all in commotion, and we are confused, 
and we do things haphazardly, there's no organization, no system, everybody does whatever they can to escape okay. the ordeal, potential ordeal. So lots of other say that this is just a microscopic image of what's going to happen to everybody collectively on the day of judgment. So the idea of the Quran is to instill fear in the minds and the hearts of people. It is by design. Yeah. So some people say, why are you instilling fear in people? Well, that's the whole idea. <laughs> that's what this eye is supposed to do. That uh, whatever it is you think you can do, you will not be able to do on the day of judgment. And whatever it is you think you can do in this world is limited. Because even in this world, la yumlikuna mithqala zabat. You don't control or own anything in the heavens or in the earth. And it is the plight of the human being. Where if Allah has bestowed upon you certain abilities, then you serve your master as his servant, as his ad, as Dawud and Suleiman. You don't become so arrogant and ruthless and rude, or you don't become presumptuous that this is yours. And nobody's going to touch well, whatever it is you have is number one. It's, it's minuscule. Yeah? It's minuscule. If you have a billion dollars, even that's minuscule compared to the khazain, the treasures of the earth and in the heavens of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is insignificant and it is negligible. So this is what mithqal, mithqal al the weight of a dharra. The is translated generally as an atom. A small mustard seed. The, the, the seed has insignificant weight. Insignificant. It's negligible. So if you have a billion dollars, mashallah, a trillion dollars, it is still insignificant in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he is al-Ali al-Kabir. He is so high and he is kabir. So now imagine that he can create this grand spectacle for all the trillions of human beings who have lived on this earth in one moment on one platform and there's nothing there except total darkness. So the idea of the Quran is for the human being to paint this picture, draw this picture, this image in his mind, in his imagination, which we are now very easily able to do so thanks to graphics. The computer has allowed human beings to think this way. Think about it. Put yourself in there. First of all, in this dark room, turn off all the lights and make sure there's no light uh, coming in and out, and you see that you, you'll be petrified. You'll be terrified. Then imagine that this hall is now the whole world, and there's no light anywhere, no sun, no moon, no, moon, no stars, and you don't know who's there, who's not. All you know is that you are going to be held accountable in front of Allah for your audit. This is your hisab. So what are you going to say? Mother. What is this? Someone will answer. Most professors will say, Allah will answer. Rabbukum. It's your Lord. So now, your billion dollars, your trillion dollars, your accolades, okay, all your accomplishments, all your labor, and everything that you planned, and you did, and you strategized, and you thought, and you fantasized in the world. Now, that is not even a bad nightmare. It's gone. This is the reality. This is the haq. So the idea in this ayah is to induce within the human being this ability to think about this time when they will be terrified and petrified and absolutely in fright. And this is the purpose. Why? So that you take advantage of your time in this world and you prepare for that moment. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps you prepare for that moment, Allah will save you even at that moment. As the Quran says, and as the Hadith says, MashaAllah, that on that day, there will be people who will not be frightened. And there will be people who will be underneath the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's arsh and throne. So now you strive in your life here to make sure you're from that class of people. Instead of blaming God, instead of saying that religion 
makes you this way. This. No, religion makes you super aggressive in preparing for tomorrow. Religion makes you uh, so alert that you'll prepare not only for this life, but for the next life. Right. Say if you're telling your child, MashaAllah, alhamdulillah, at the age of seven, I want you to be a doctor. Now you're forecasting the next 20 years of hard labor. Why are you saying to the kid, for the next 20 years you're going to be uh, killing yourself studying, studying, studying. Now isn't that frightening? To seven year old? No? But you endure it and you celebrate it and then you congratulate yourselves when he or she becomes a doctor after 20 years. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. And you have parties after parties. No? So Allah is saying that you plan in this world for your future, for the future of your children and your grandchildren, and you have no hesitation whatsoever in telling them the truth. And what's the truth? 20 years of hard labor. You're going to be in the university camps. In the camp of the school first, high school, and then the college camp, which is literally a camp, campus, and then the university camp, campus, and in the hospital camp and campus, uh, where you're going to do your resida- re- residency, and you're going to do rotations, then you have a fellowship, and then God knows what, and then after 25 years of hard labor, you are now where you should be. And then there's more hard labor, because next 30 years you're going to be paying off all your debts. And you have absolutely no problem mentioning this to your beta, beta, mashallah, subhanallah. Allah is saying, extend this to the day of judgment. Yeah. Extend this idea and philosophy to the day. So we are warning you not because we want to hurt you, but because we want you to be prepared for that moment so that you're not at a cultural shock when it happens. When you have iman and faith and you trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah will protect you in this world and in the world hereafter, then you become smart then you become aggressive, then you prepare for every moment in life and every moment of death. Anyway, this is the way the Sahaba and the Anbiya would see these ayat as a means of uh, preparation for the next world, uh, as a means of making sure they don't get entangled with all the rat race issues and problems of this world that makes them inert and lethargic. Right? So, in the Ladina Amanu, Amilu, a salihat. With Iman, there's always Amal. Iman creates your Amal. Amal is action. That's how you translate it. Right? Doing of good deeds. Doing is about doing. Yeah. So, now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah, I'amalu ala Dawood al Shukra. In the early ayat, when we discussed Dawood alayhi salam, that Dawood was given this kingdom and all of these great abilities as a fadl from Allah, as a neighbor from Allah, then Dawood did what he did out of shukr. Not out of kufr. Kufr means pride and arrogance. Shukr means that you are humble in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you worship him. Whenever you worship him, you see his aliyul kabir. Wahul aliyul kabir. Most high. So in your dua, your tasbih, you say Subhan Rabbi al Azim and Subhan Rabbi al Ala. You mention the highness and also the loftiness and the uh, supremacy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are a humble servant when you are in the state of worship. And if you fear poverty, and if you fear that you will not have a job, or if you fear that you won't have enough money, then you must also believe that Allah controls your risk. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who is going to feed you from the heavens and the earth? That your risk comes from the heavens and also from the earth. Some mufassirun will say, risk from the heavens means rain and other provisions that come to us through the sky, and so on. And it may be much broader than that, and different types of risk. 
and so on. So we here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exhorting human beings to trust Him and believe that He is the one who feeds them and provides for them, albeit through human beings. In that you have a workplace, you have a job, you're employed, you have an employer, and they are the reason why you earn some money, and the money is the reason why you're able to buy some products and food, and you must now go the next step and say, where does this food come from? You have a billion dollars, mashallah, but you're not able to eat because you're sick. So what good is though are those billion dollars to you? So Allah is asking the question, who feeds you? Mayarzukukum. Who actually provides the food for you? You work 20 dog hours and you barely have time to eat a sandwich. Now, is that risk? Is that hard labor? What is that? <laughs> no? Do you understand what I'm saying? So here the question is, who gives you food? Not who gives you money. Who is feeding you? So if you don't have time to drink a glass of water, and you don't have time even to eat a sandwich, and you're saying, I'm earning good, mashallah, what are you earning? And what is God feeding you? Nothing. He's feeding you hard labor. Now sit down, relax, enjoy your food. Take time out. Enjoy your breakfast. Enjoy your lunch. Enjoy your dinner. I mean, I don't mean two hours or three hours. At least five minutes, ten minutes. Sit down, relax. Allah's risk is here. Now, this risk is independent of my earnings. And what's the proof? The proof is you have a million dollars, a billion dollars, and sometimes you don't eat. And those who don't have any money, they always eat. So who's feeding? It's not your employer. It's not the money. It's not your bank account. It is Allah. May yarzukukum. Who's feeding you? From the heavens and on earth, from the earth, is Allah. So once you start to enjoy the fruits of your labor and you spend your money correctly, you start enjoying something called food. Risk. But if you don't enjoy those moments when you are eating, then you will not be enjoying what it is Allah has given you. Because if you don't eat from the fruit of your labor, what else are you going to eat? You can't eat your labor. You can't eat your money. If you have 50 uh, bars of gold locked up in the vault, and you say, Marshal, I've made it. Where have you made it? You can't eat the gold. You can eat a very simple Subway sandwich and enjoy it. Or you can have a good coffee from Starbucks, enjoy it. And say, Alhamdulillah. And then you say, Alhamdulillah. Allah has fed you, say, Alhamdulillah. Do you say, Alhamdulillah, when you earn money? No. I mean, you can. But the real Alhamdulillah is, Alhamdulillah, alladhi at'amana. All praise due to Allah, the one who has fed us. When do you say this dua? After you eat. Not before you eat. Do you say Alhamdulillah before you eat or after you eat? After you eat. So what do you say before you eat? Bismillah. And after you eat, you say Alhamdulillah. So praise is to Allah, the one who feeds you. So Allah is asking this fundamental question. You may have a billion dollars, a trillion dollars, whatever it is, Allah give you his barakah. But the barakah is when you eat. Not when you starve. So that obviously healthy food and toilet food, no doubt. But at the same time, human beings must not live in this fallacy of saying the more money I have, the more risk I have. It doesn't go together. That's a myth. So he's asking this question. Say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, spare them the anxiety of their own foolishness. And tell them it is Allah who feeds them. Don't let them answer the question. Because they don't know the answer. They've never tasted the answer. Allah is the one who feeds them. Allah. That's the answer. Allah yurzukuhum. Allah is the one who feeds them. And then, O Muhammad wasallam, show them the way that if you believe in Allah, and you believe that he feeds you, 
then either us or you have one of two paths. Either we are on huda, hidayat, and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or we, or you, or both are on dalalim mubin, an open error, a very manifest error, a very false paradigm, and a very corrupt understanding of the world and a world view. So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exhorting human beings to understand his might, his power, his fadl. What is his fadl? His fadl is, okay, alhamdulillah. Wealth, no doubt, is a ni'am. Huge ni'am from Allah. Allah give us barakah in whatever we have. At the same time, the purpose of acquiring all, all of this wealth is not to hoard it. That's That we must not be hoarding wealth. The purpose of wealth is to use it. What is the use of wealth? That you have good food, that you have good clothing, you have good uh, transportation, and you have a good house. If you can afford all of this in a nice way, that is Allah's fadl, where Allah's fadl is always accompanied with barakah. But if you're bending over backwards, that even though you have some what of a decent house and a good house, and some decent food and clothing, and decent means of transportation, uh, etc., and you're bending over backwards to make sure you are at now at the most luxurious level on all of this. And that's vanity. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that if Allah's fadl is apparent with you at you, uh, all the time and you're eating good and you're healthy and you all of this, then you say you are on the right path. Allah hudan. You are on guidance from Allah. This is right. And if you think otherwise, then you're in dhalali mubin, that you're in a very manifest error. That you're making a big, big mistake, a huge mistake. Uh, with regards to your world view and how you want your life to be in the next 40-50 years. This is Allah's hidayah and guidance through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Here you see the Quran always asks the question and the Quran always instructs the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to relay the answer. Qul. Allah is the one who is instructing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as the supreme perfect human being, you must inform people this is the correct answer. Yeah. You understand? That's why he's a Rasulullah. Mm. So it's a maqam. It's a station, a rank in the eyes of Allah that Allah appoints the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to answer on behalf of Allah to all human beings. This is the answer. And this is the correct approach so that people respect him for being the messenger. So they, you don't have time to speculate. Okay? Who feeds you from the heavens and the earth? Well, you know, this happens and this happens and the laws of nature come in and this naturalism and this atheism and all of that. And then all of a sudden we get food on the table. So Allah says to the Prophet, tell them, you know, give it up. Take a break from being stupid. Qulillah. Says Allah. Period. No further discussion is needed. It's the simplest answer, and it's the only answer. This is how the Nabi is, in the, is a rahmah to all human beings. That the Nabi gives you the answer which is based on wahi, not on speculation. But human beings don't like wahi because it stops them from thinking. We say, you don't know how to think. Thinking has gotten you nowhere. You're still the same, okay? War, torn world through your thinking. Fine. There's much more war now than there ever was before in human history. So what has your thinking brought you to? Now you will say you're civilized, okay? Well, what type of civilization is this where you don't want to feed people and you don't want to feel sorry for refugees and the victims of nature and the victims of your man-made wars? You have no compassion left. That's your civilization. So the Prophet ﷺ is instructed by Allah. Ya Rasulullah. Ya Nabi Allah, give them the answer. Tell them to stop thinking. It is Allah. If you stop thinking and you believe in wahi, then you will have the rahmah. As this is what is mentioned in the next few ayat, inshaAllah. Qul la tus'aloona amma ajramna. 
وَلَا تُسَلْ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Say to them, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, pronounce and declare that they, you will not be asked about what others are committing as crimes. Ajramna, what we have committed. If there has been a crime committed by us, you will not be questioned about that on the day of judgment. Likewise, we will not be questioned about what you are doing. Our hisab is with Allah, and your hisab is with Allah. Allah is the one who is going to question both of us, so we need to work for ourselves independent of whatever it is you think and you believe, so that we are at least saved, and we take care of ourselves, not just here, but over there. So this is uh, the Prophet ﷺ being asked to exonerate himself, from being responsible for the disbelief in the world. Meaning the Prophet does not serve as a redeemer for the crimes and sins of other people. The Prophet keeps every individual and every individual people in the communities responsible for their acts and for their crimes. So I'm not going to answer for your crimes and you are not going to answer for my crimes. Meaning that you can't take a break and say, ah, someone else is going to answer for all our sins. He's a redeemer. That's no good. <laughs> you as a human being, you are individually responsible for you, for you, for your life, for your actions and everything you do in this world. <laughs> that man is only going to receive what he works for. So we're not going to pass on the back. If you are responsible for a mistake or a crime or a sin, then you should own up. And the way you do that is by asking Allah's forgiveness. And you reform yourself and you correct yourself. So this ayah is an ayah of rahmah. Although it is exonerating us and the Prophet ﷺ, whatever, whatever others do, this ayah shows that underneath it and behind it, there is a rahmah, there is a mercy. And that the way for you is to own up to your mistakes and then make tawbah, ask for people's forgiveness, ask for Allah's forgiveness, and then you will not be questioned either on the day of judgment. That's one approach. The second is that the community of human beings on the day of judgment will be separated and organized according to their faith. Either you have belief or you don't have belief. And then according to their actions, that some people will be good and others will not so will not be so good and all of their procedures will be handled separately and individually. However, they will be collectively gathered on the same platform on the same time. Qul yajma'u baynana rabbuna Say to them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that oh, both you and uh, we, we will be gathered. Allah our Lord will gather us and bring us together. And then he will judge between us with the truth. Yaftahu means to judge. So on that day, he will say, this group is right and this group is wrong. Okay. As communities. Meaning as, as the, the ummah. So the ummah of iman and there's the ummah of no iman or lack of iman and so on. So they will be divided and arranged in platoons this way. You can see the uh, spectacular moment. Uh, in human history, human history doesn't begin with someone's birth. A human being's life begins from the Ahad of Alast, according to the Quran, the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a covenant from all of us with Adam alayhi salam being there. That is when our history started. And human history does not finish it goes through phases. So there's another phase. After we are resurrected, there's another phase of human history. In this phase of human history, human beings will be separated and they will either belong to those who have salvation and those who don't. Then those who have salvation, they will also be accounted for and they will also be audited according to the rules and procedures of the Day of Judgment. So here Allah is saying, ثُمَّ يَفْتَحُ بَيْنَنَا بِالْحَقِّ 
then he will judge us and between us with the haq, with the truth. This is the haq. And so, meaning that human beings, whatever they want to do with their will, with their volition, and they want to aspire and be ambitious, that's all fine. As long as they have their destiny in front of them. What is their destiny? This is their destiny. So the point of human beings and their endeavors and human history is to find a way where everyone are able to enter Jannah, where the community of the people of Jannah will be together forever, inshallah. Yaftahu baynana bilakh. So this yaftahu, that means to open and give a victory, is now referring to the victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give by judging that this group is Naji, saved, and this group is not Naji, not saved. In that meaning, we say decisive judgment. Yaftahu, which means open. So it's an open, decisive victory and judgment in favor of those who believe in Allah and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's uh, reassuring to all Muslims that although you may not be judged favorably, by certain people in this world, in this country, at this moment, there will be a time that if you hang on to your core values, and if you hang on to your faith, and your love for Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and your love for Allah and the Quran and the Deen, Allah will judge in your favor. But you have to wait a bit. <laughs> after you die, this will come after you die. So it's not just that you live here; you're going to live after you die also. So look forward to that moment and that day and then uh, spring with hope and move forward with hope and ambition. You may win, you may lose. Only Allah knows. Inshallah we will win in this world also. Bidnillah. Through Allah's fadl and the du'as and all the uh, the tawbah and the istighfar and the sadaqah and uh, everything else that we do to bring about Allah's fadl and nusrah and help upon us. Wa huwa al-fattah al-alim. He is the one who is the one who is always opening, right? always creating openings for people. Al Fatah, the one who is constantly, continuously, perpetually opening uh, ideas and thoughts and doors, windows and doors uh, for people in this world and also for people in the grave and also for people on the day of judgment. Right? So we see here Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's fadl is based upon this idea, or this aqeedah, alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are moments in a human being's history when he feels as if he or she is cornered, and then Allah creates an opening. He is al fatah Right? So for that Allah has given us many examples in the Quran, as I've mentioned before, some of the best examples is when you are trapped inside the stomach of a whale, where there's no opening. And you're surrounded by darkness and darkness and darkness, and there's no opening. So there you must concede that you are the worst person on the planet. Not say, why me? The fault of the human being is to blame God. And the magic and the charm of a Nabi is to say, I'm the one that's wrong. La ilaha illa anta, subhanaka. Then, Inni kuntu min I am the one that's wrong. I'm here, I'm swallowed by the whale, but I'm wrong. Allah is not wrong. Allah is not wrong. So that doors open when you concede that you're human. Doors open when you concede that you're nothing. Doors open when you see Allah is the most high, al kabir the greatest. I am nothing. I'm insignificant. When you go out on, uh, on this tangent, on this rant, I am the greatest, I am the best, and this and that. No, see, no doors are those open. They're going to close. I'm not talking about uh, our president. I'm talking about the Muslims. Right? I'm talking about the Muslim community. Though we have this, we have this. Okay, subhanAllah. Where do you think you got this from? You say, Alhamdulillah. You don't say, I got this. I earned this. I made this. I'm the champion. I'm the best. That is kibar. Kibar means that you are big. And you think yourself to be big. Allah says, He is the one who is the greatest. Al-Kabir. And that's why in your salat you say, Allahu Akbar. Allah is greater than me. 
whatever I have uh, accomplished and achieved in this world. So, if you want to benefit from Allah's name, Al-Fattah, then you are going to have to be humble. You must acquiesce, resign and submit that you are nothing in front of Allah and you must say you deserve nothing. Until you use that formula of Yunus alayhi salam, Inni kuntu min al-dhalimeen, that indeed I am from those who are unjust and wrongdoers, there will be no najat, no, no salvation. When Yunus alayhi salam mentioned this in the well, from which there is no opening, Allah says, فَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمْ Then we delivered him from this problem and this issue and this ordeal. And then Allah promises, كَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Likewise, we will save all believers. Meaning, if believers follow this formula of saying that we are wrong and Allah is right and we need his help and Allah is the only one who can help us, then Allah will save believers. If you don't believe and you're stuck in this rat race of finding a solution with this person, this person, this group, this group, and you're going here and there, and you are running around like a chicken without a head. No purpose in life. All you want is the dunya, peace, security, this and that. And you don't want salvation, the akhirah. You don't want to follow the Prophet Sallallahu and his role model. Then Allah says there is no guarantee that people will be saved. This is the formula. Al-Fattah. Uh, Al-Fattah means the one who will always open. If you ask him, all you have to do is knock on his door. <laughs> How do you knock on Allah's door? You offer two rakats salat al haja You make dua, you make dhikr, you make istighfar, you give sadaqah, you help people. This is how you knock on Allah's door. And when you knock on Allah's door, he opens. Not does he only open, he opens all the time. Al-Fattah. Why? Because he is Al-Alim. The one who knows eternally how he creates and how human beings must behave in order for him to create the opening. This is his world and what he does is through his rules of Qadr and everything else. So we as Muslims are guided by Allah and the Rasul وسلم, both in the Quran and the Sunnah as to how to navigate, negotiate ourselves in this world so that we don't bend over backwards doing the wrong thing. So we, we, our lives are governed by this belief that we, uh, we see Allah in a good light. Alhamdulillah. A positive light. That anything and everything Allah does is for the better, is for good. And we must prove through our actions, that Allah does this for us. And if we, if we do this, then indeed Allah will be on our side and He will help us. At the same time, we must not do anything to bring about the anger and wrath of Allah upon us, nor upon other people uh, by behaving ourselves. <laughs> we have to behave ourselves. That's the bottom line. And so, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Sirah is the role model. How do you behave with your neighbors? How do you behave with the community? How do you behave with people? How do you behave with arrogant people? How do you behave with uh, ignorant people? How do you behave with ruthless people? How do you do behave with tyrants? It's all there, guidance in the Quran. Yeah. So behave appropriately according to the guidance. Then you will see Allah will open. Allah will always give, inshallah, openings to those who look for guidance and serve Allah for the right reasons. May Allah make life easy for us, both in this world and also in the world hereafter, and give us najat, peace and security in this world, and also in the world hereafter. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen.